morning, Lionhearts. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I'm actually doing pretty good. I went to the grocery store first thing this morning. I got everything I needed, and I was done shopping for the day at 8 a.m. So, today I want to go out and do a movie location vlog, something that we won't be around a lot of people. In fact, hopefully we won't be around anyone. And we'll get to do a movie location that is often requested on this channel. It's something that I've loved since I was a kid. It has a lot of people in the movie that I love. Um, it's starring John Cusack, David Ogden Steers, Kim Darby, Curtis Armstrong, aka Booger from Revenge of the Nerds. And it's the classic uh, old 1980. When you say I love 80s movies, this is like one of those first ones that pops into your head, I feel like. Better Off Dead. So we're going to go see a couple of the houses. We're going to see as much as we can today. And hopefully if you're looking for something to watch while we're all kind of hanging out at home, maybe this will be something that you're inspired to go watch. So let's go see the filming locations of Better Off Dead from 1985. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. All right, our first stop's gonna be over in Glendale today, not Greendale like in the movie. They say it's in Northern California in the movie, but we're actually in Southern California in reality. All right, to be sure, Better Off Dead was definitely a black comedy. This was a movie about basically Lane Meyer, played by John Cusack, is a guy who, at the beginning of the movie, his girlfriend, Beth, dumps him and throughout the movie he's looking for ways to kill himself but they always um, end up getting flubbed up in some comedic way so now we are at Lane Meyer's house let's take a look now this movie was not a success right away it's gone down as a cult classic but when it came out Siskel and Ebert gave it two thumbs down and even John Cusack walked out of the screening because he hated it so much. He actually said to the director it was one of the worst things he'd ever seen, if not the worst thing he'd ever seen, and that he would never trust the director ever again, and he felt that the director made him look stupid in the movie. Now, this movie actually starts with David Ogden Steers asleep, the dad of this family, and <laughs> here's the paper boy. Like, he knows that's the time the paper boy is coming, and the paper boy is trucking up this street to deliver the paper. And you see David Ogden Steers. Now, the house has changed quite a bit, as you can tell. The doesn't have the blue door anymore, and it doesn't have the same garage door with the windows because that's what he's coming down to prevent the paper boy from breaking the windows by throwing the paper through there. There's actually a row of windows that goes across here and all of them are broken except for one and you can see no longer on the left side right over here was where you would put the key in to open the garage door which is how he opens it and prevents the kid from breaking the window that time but he sends the garage door up and when it comes back down it smashes down and breaks the window anyway. Now in the movie, Lane has his station wagon that is not his cool car, and then he had bought a Camaro that sits right here throughout the entirety of the movie. So along with Lane's story in this movie, we have a parallel story running along that is this French foreign exchange student who lives across the street with kind of the weird kid in school and the weird kid in the neighborhood, Ricky Smith. That is Monique and Monique lives right across the street, and she is pretending throughout this movie to only speak French and not to understand English because once she gets here, <laughs> Ricky's mom starts trying to force her to be Ricky's girlfriend. So this is the house that Ricky Smith lives in and Monique, and we actually see Monique sitting up on the front steps on Christmas Day um, when the family across the street are opening their presents. She's sitting up on the front doorstep watching everything that's happening. Now this is a wacky, wacky family. The dad is David Ogden Steers. He's a lawyer. The mother is Kim Darby, who was little Maddie Ross in the original True Grit, and she's really funny. This is such a crazy dysfunctional household. The mom is always trying to make some sort of different meal and the meals are always just absolutely disgusting while not noticing that Lane is going through the house trying to kill himself. He has a younger brother who is somewhat of a genius who lives up in a bedroom 
and is constantly trying to build lasers and at one point he orders a book and we see uh, the mailman come up here dropping mail along the street here very carelessly and then he walks up to the front door and uh, delivers the how to pick up trashy women book for the little kid and then Lane comes and answers the door and the mailman said hey Lane I heard you and Beth aren't seeing each other anymore you mind if I go out with her <laughs> <laughs> so on Christmas Day they're opening presents over here this is the living room area and over here is the kitchen in the living room they're opening presents and the mother has gotten everyone in the family TV dinners for presents and then the dad has replaced all the windows in the garage door and so he brings her out to show her and there's a big bow on the garage door and on the windows and she comes out and sees that he fixed it but Lane is sitting in the car inside trying to basically kill himself with the exhaust and then rolls backwards and smashes the entire garage door. So after Lane realizes that Monique can speak English they start becoming friends and one night he has already told her about the Camaro across the street that he has that doesn't work and he comes over and sees her there used to be a lemon tree or at least in the movie There was a lemon tree here, and she's got a bunch of lemons on the ground And she's throwing the lemons at a fictitious street sign that would have been right here and He's actually noticing that she's a pretty good throw because she keeps hitting the sign and then she says that she only came to America because she likes the Dodgers. <laughs> and she actually says to him, like, why, why else would anyone come to this city if it weren't for the Brooklyn Dodgers? So she tells him also then that Ricky is constantly trying to touch her and everything. And she says, he won't keep his uh, testicles off me. And Lane goes, whoa, whoa, what? He what? And she says, you know, like an octopus. And he goes, oh, oh, tentacles. Oh, that's much different, much, much different. <laughs> But throughout this movie a lot of crazy things happen that just aren't explained which is what makes it so funny So the next morning when Lane comes out to the Camaro He sees the tarp is off the tarp is off the Camaro here And she is laying underneath the car and he comes out and says excuse me Can I help you? He doesn't know it's her and she rolls out from underneath the car with her Dodger hat on and grease all over and He says you brought my car back to life she said, well, not entirely. Help me push it into the garage. And then they start bonding by working on it in the garage in there. And then he realizes then that he has to go and have the, the big ski, ski off with Stalin. That's the last name of his arch nemesis that now is dating Beth in the movie. Now this movie's really great because it has a lot of running gags that go on throughout the movie. One of which is that um, the paperboy is constantly chasing down Lane to collect his two dollars. He's always wanting to collect for the month and Lane never has the money so no matter where Lane is in this entire movie, that paperboy is out riding around on the bike saying, two dollars! Now also there's one other running gag that I can tell you about when we go to our next location. So let's head over to Lancashire Boulevard. So one interesting piece of trivia about this movie is if you remember in the New Year's Dancing with E.G. Daly, she is singing the Better Off Dead theme song. She's also the voice of Tommy Pickles in Rugrats and was Dottie in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Now if you're wondering if we're going to do all those skiing scenes, no we are not. <laughs> I am not a skier and we are not in Utah and that's where they filmed all of those. Right here beside what we're looking for is this old classic Silver Saddle Motel. Take a look at this. They even have an old <laughs> An old horse up on top of the building. Isn't that amazing? This is what old North Hollywood used to be like. Places like this. So here it is. What used to be in the movie, Pig Burgers, was actually Sandy's Burgers in real life. And I told you that there was kind of a running gag that ties in with this. Let me tell you about it now. So in the movie, every time Lane goes out driving by himself and he starts thinking about Beth breaking up with him, he stopped at a stop sign and 
Two Asian guys always pull up next to him in a car and they always challenge him to race. Now he explains in the movie that one of them doesn't speak any English and that the other only learned how to speak English through watching the wide world of sports. So he says, what would be worse or what would you rather do, not speak any English at all or only speak like Howard Cosell? And both of those times in the movie, originally that we see him, when they challenge him to race, the first time he thinks he's going forward but he actually hits the car in reverse and backs into the guy that owns Pig Burgers and then the second time he's behind the guy who owns Pig Burgers and rear ends him. So he ends up working here thanks to his dad, Al Meyer. Here inside Pig Burgers we see Lane starting his first day of work and the boss comes in <laughs> and looks at him and says, so you're Al Meyer's kid. You look pretty stupid to me. He teaches him how he wants him to put the the thing that makes the pig logo in the burgers and how to pat it down gives him a whole lesson on that and uh, and then pulls his false teeth out washes them off in a drink and tells him that you got to be classy to work in this business <laughs> so it's a really funny part and this is also where the guy who owns it gives him the keys and tells him he wants him to open on saturday mornings which allows lane to eventually use this later on in the movie but while he's here learning and they give him that crazy hat to wear and everything, that's when he does his daydream because he looks up and sees the poster of the woman that says, everybody wants some, and he starts hearing the Van Halen song, everybody wants some, wants some too. Oh yeah, really, really great part in the movie. And then of course he starts daydreaming, thinking that he's Frankenstein creating this burger in here, and then when the burger comes out, it's animated and it's got a guitar that's painted like Eddie Van Halen's guitar. And then all of a sudden the owner of the business comes running in and yells at Lane because he's burning all the burgers. Then the guy that owns the restaurant ends up grabbing Lane and throwing him out into the dining area of the restaurant. And he looks up and sees Beth and Stalin on a date and they start making fun of him. But have no fear, Lane does eventually find love because he falls in love with Monique and he decides to woo her by bringing her on a date here. And he ends up driving that Camaro that they fixed up together, um, well, with her in it, and they drive in right to this, right through this driveway right here. So the Camaro pulls in right here through the driveway and then drives up and parks on the side. And then he has her blindfolded and ends up walking her in through that side door over there you can see. The time there would have been a lot of glass like any restaurant would have. And he would walk her in through that side door and then the uh, the table that they were sitting at for their date was just to the right of the door over there. So it had basically been right here that they had their dining experience where Lane excuses himself for a moment and then comes walking out playing the saxophone. All right, let's head off to our next stop. Now our next location is actually in one of my favorite neighborhoods in all of Los Angeles. It's the same area where the Hallowell Mansion is and the Thriller Mansion. Going to Joanna Greenwald's house. And there's our downtown skyline as well. See these are the kind of houses that for the most part dominate this area. This is a very old section of Los Angeles that they have preserved so if you buy one of these houses you have to maintain the look and the upkeep of it so that it can't be changed or anything. They, they make you stick to some pretty strict guidelines, but that's good. So let's go see the house. So after Lane destroys the garage door, his dad calls him into the dining room and has a little talk with him and says, I want you to get back out into dating. So I want you to date my partner's daughter. And he says, what the girl with the big antenna on her head? But he tries to make the best of it. So he comes here to pick up Joanna Greenwald he walks up to the front door, rings the doorbell, and then she comes out and says, look, I'm only doing this because my dad's making me, so why don't we just cut to the chase? She pulls out a calculator, <laughs> and she goes, okay, $10 each for dinner, assuming you're not a cheapskate. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Then she says, a dollar each for double desserts, that's $22 plus tip and tax, that's 
2637 so why don't you just give me $13.17 now and we'll call it a night. And so he pulls out his checkbook and says, do you accept checks? Great scene. So, so much for Joanna Greenwald being the one to bring him out of his slump. He'll have to wait for Monique to do that. So like I mentioned earlier, Monique says in the movie, why else would anybody come here if it weren't to see the Dodgers? So, the very end of the movie we see a shot of Monique and Lane and the Camaro. We actually can't see the stadium today because the whole stadium's closed down. But at the very end you see the camera start panning back and fading out showing the whole stadium and then you see the paper boy riding <laughs> right from center field towards second base over the pitcher's mound yelling for his two dollars. I did pass through Elysium Park and went to some of the other entrances and was able to at least get out here to show you some of the stadium from afar. And that is all that we can do today for Better Off Dead filming locations. Now let's head on home. All right, Lionhearts, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I have never been to any of those filming locations before, so this was all new to me, and I love that movie, and I hope if you haven't seen it in a while, you'll go watch it now. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you all next time. Goodbye. Goodbye.